I want to begin by saying that we live in very judgmental times. I think everybody would agree with that. The amount of blaming and judging and condemning regularly being done by people against other people in our society is disturbing. People have always been judgy toward each other, but it seems to be at an all-time high over the last many months. Sometimes people are guilty and deserve to be called out for what they've done. Other times, though, the mob rule is scary as a person's guilt is determined apart from any reliable evidence or reasonable considerations. But the part of all of this that is the most disturbing is the absence of grace and forgiveness. If you have fallen out of step with the group mind that has judged and condemned you, there is no chance for redemption. I'm so grateful that the kingdom of God does not work the way that human society does. The Lord is gracious and merciful, extending forgiveness to us through Jesus Christ. Today we're going to be completing our study of the extended teaching by Jesus that runs from Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7, which has come to be called the Sermon on the Mount. So if you have your Bible, as I've said earlier, turn to Matthew chapter 7. That's where we'll be today. As we have mentioned before, if you have missed any of the teachings from this series on the Sermon on the Mount, you can always get a hold of those and catch up and fill in the blanks that you have uh, through our church website under the Watch and Listen tab. All of the teachings are there, both in audio format and video format. But let's go ahead and get into the teaching for today. Matthew 7, beginning in verse 1, Jesus says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It's good for us to remember first that Jesus is speaking to his followers in the Sermon on the Mount. I think it's good for us as his followers to keep in mind, especially in this teaching on judging other people. Religious people can tend to be some of the judgiest people there are. And right here, Jesus is telling us that we, his followers, we don't have authority to judge other people. No matter how good you think you are, you are not good enough to judge other folks. That is a prerogative of Jesus, not us. The judging that Jesus is talking about here has to do with our comparing ourselves to one another, looking down on one another, feeling superior to one another, criticizing one another, finding fault in one another. He's not talking about judging that takes place in a court of law, for example. That's not the kind of judging he's talking about here. He's talking about all of our own personal judging. Our judging of others will be reflected back to us, it says here. We will be judged in the same way we judge others. With the measure we use, it will be measured to us. And when we think about that, that should be a motivator for us to be very generous in extending grace and mercy to others. Think about it as a mercy bank, in a way. It's to our advantage to make as many deposits into our mercy bank as we can, extending lots of mercy to others so that when we need mercy, there will be plenty of it there for us. Verse 3, he continues on this topic and he says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This is a funny image that Jesus paints for us, isn't it? Of a person with this large piece of lumber sticking out of their eye, trying to help someone else remove a tiny speck from their eye. And for very obvious reasons, we should first remove this big, 
wooden plank from our own eye before we start trying to help someone else with their issue. It's amazing how blind we can be to our own faults. And at the same time, so quick to see the faults of others. And when we see our own faults, we are so gracious and merciful to ourselves, justifying our choices, explaining our behaviors. But the faults of others, we are quick to judge and condemn. Someone once said that we are very good lawyers for our own mistakes, but very good judges for the mistakes of others. Most of us are familiar with the expression, love the sinner but hate the sin. And that's a good credo. Sadly, though, too often we are self-righteous and judgmental and we end up hating the sin and withholding our love from the sinner until we approve of their behavior. That's not the same as love the sinner but hate the sin. Our love extended to others is supposed to be as unconditional as the love that we've received from the Lord. 1 Peter 4.8, Peter said, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. See, our job as followers of Jesus is not to find fault in others and judge and condemn them for their, for their faults. Our job is to help others find the Lord of mercy and grace. So, we can so they can receive the same kind of love and forgiveness that we have. And now that we have received his forgiveness and love, we are to imitate the Lord of mercy and grace in our own interactions with other people. Well, Galatians 6, the first five verses there, give us some guidance for how to care for someone who's tangled up in a sin, someone who we might otherwise judge. Because I know that's one of the things that's rattling around in the back of our mind when we read these scriptures about don't judge people. And we think, yeah, but what, what do we do when we ought to be judging that guy? Well, Galatians 6 helps us with some of that. So flip over to Galatians 6.1. And Paul writes here, he says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Well, who is qualified to help another person caught in a sin? He says, You who live by the Spirit, the person who has the mind of Jesus Christ, who is thinking the way Jesus Christ thinks, who cares for the person the way that Jesus cares for the person who's motivated by the same things that Jesus is motivated by. It says, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person. That word restore in the Greek, it was used in the medical field to refer to the setting of a broken bone. It was used in the fishing industry to refer to, refer to the mending of a torn net. This word means to put something back in its proper place, to mend what's broken and damaged. The goal and the objective of our interaction with another person should always be to restore that person, to see them put back together, healed, rescued, redeemed, saved. The goal is never to humiliate or put down or get revenge. If, if we don't have the same heart that Jesus does in this, then we ought to just keep our mouth shut and go into our prayer closet and pray for the person. It says to restore them gently. The confrontation and the restoration of the person should be done gently, carefully, with deep humility. It says watch yourself. We never want to forget our own weakness and vulnerability. The roles could easily be reversed. I mean, we should treat this person in the same way that we would want to be treated if it were us in that situation. Verse 2 says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. The burdens that Paul is referring to here are the burdens of this life. 
whether they are trials and temptations, physical struggles or struggles of the heart, we're to help each other through life is the basic idea here. And in verse 3, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. A reminder here that we are all sitting in boats with holes in them. We're all weak and vulnerable. None of us have it all together. We may be looking good today, but there's always tomorrow <laughs> when everything can quickly come unraveled for us. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. We need to mind our own business and examine our own life rather than picking through our neighbor's garbage. We need to take care of our own side of the street, as they say. We need to tend to the plank in our eye rather than trying to help others with the speck in theirs. Christians have a reputation as judgmental people being quick to point out the sins of others and turning a blind eye to our own sins. May we be known as people who are generous with grace and mercy, measuring out big scoops of it to others, rather than those who are quick to find faults and harsh in our judgments. Back over Matthew 7, verse 6. Jesus says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So this, this next uh, little teaching that he gives us here, dogs and pigs, they were considered animals to be avoided in those days by the Jews. Pigs, they were not kosher to eat, and they themselves, they ate scraps and garbage. The street dogs were scavengers, and they could be vicious. There was nothing cute and cuddly about the pigs and the dogs in those days. They represented just the opposite. There are a number of ways that this verse can be applied, and among them, Jesus is telling us to use wise judgment with our generosity and blessing extended to other people. It, it, it doesn't make any sense to force the gospel of Jesus Christ down a person's throat. If someone has asked us to leave them alone and not talk to them about Jesus, then we should respect their wishes. One commentator put it this way, disciples of Jesus are not to be stormtroopers for the kingdom of God. We want to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and use wise judgment in who and how and where we share the message and the love of Jesus Christ with others. You might remember when Jesus sent his disciples out to preach the good news about him. He said to shake the dust from their sandals and go to the next town if they were not welcomed somewhere. We have a similar idea being taught to us here. In a general sense, we want to be wise and respectful in our interactions with other people. Verse 7, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Ask, seek, knock. Jesus is talking about our approaching our Heavenly Father in prayer. And it's interesting that these words are in the sense of continuous, persistent action. So he's saying, ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. And then verse 8 gives us this wonderful promise that our Heavenly Father will answer us. He will respond to us. He will give to us. He will show us. He will welcome us in. And then Jesus illustrates further in the next verses. In verse 9, he says, which of you? If your son asks for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. 
If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? No loving parent would try to deceive and trick their child, giving them a stone in place of bread or a snake in place of fish for food. They, they wouldn't give them something in place of real food which is inedible or even harmful for them. If even you and I, with all of our issues and problems and shortcomings, know how to give our children good things, how much more, Jesus says, will our perfect, loving, selfless, generous, infinitely patient Heavenly Father give good things to us? Our Heavenly Father is so much better than any of us could ever imagine being as parents. We can trust him. We don't need to be afraid of him. He's always good. He's always approachable. He's always available. He's always there for us. Jesus is not saying that anything we ask for will be given to us. Our Heavenly Father loves us too much for that. Not everything we ask for is good for us to have. We need to be as grateful for the no's as we are for the yeses. Be grateful that your Heavenly Father retains veto rights over your prayers. I mean, can you imagine what a nightmare it would be if your prayers were answered exactly the way you have always prayed them? That would be scary indeed. What Jesus is addressing here in these verses is our understanding of who God is. God is not a distant, reluctant, remote, unengaged, uninterested, impersonal God or force in the universe. Instead, he's deeply engaged, aware, concerned, involved, personal, generous, willing, welcoming, kind, wise. We are invited to come to ask, to seek, to knock, we will receive, we will find, we will be invited in. When we approach our Heavenly Father in prayer, we're, we're not wrenching things out of His stingy, reluctant hands. Instead, when we approach, He says, Come in, child, tell me your heart. Verse 12, it may be included as part of, part of the, the same paragraph as these verses we've just looked at in your English translation, but it's really a, a separate teaching on its own here. Verse 12, he says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. This is commonly called the golden rule. Because it captures in a single sentence the teaching of Jesus on how we should treat others. And really it captures the breadth of the whole sermon, doesn't it? When we consider the generous, kind treatment that we have received ourselves from our Heavenly Father, we can't do other than what is being said here. When we are in doubt about how to treat another person, about choices to make which can impact other people. Applying this rule, this principle, it helps us to choose what to do, doesn't it? I mean, if I were in that person's position, what would I want done to me? How would I want to be treated? What would I consider fair? I want us to notice that this rule, this principle, is stated in the positive. It's not simply describing how we are to react to how we are treated by another, although that's being addressed here as well. But rather, this is also how we are to act proactively, taking the initiative in doing to others. When we do to and for others, this is how we do it. In everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. 
In these next passages uh, that take us really to the end of the sermon, down through verse 27, Jesus talks about two ways, using several examples. There are those who take the narrow road and those who take the wide road. There are those who bear good fruit and those who bear bad fruit. There are wise builders and there are foolish builders. In verse 13, he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Following Jesus and his teachings is the narrow road. And this is the road that leads to life. Truth and righteousness are not determined by what is popular or widely accepted. Majority rules is not the way the kingdom of God is led. Now I want to clarify that being popular or accepted by the majority does not automatically mean that something is wrong. The truth can be widely accepted, and we hope that it is. Doing the right thing can be widely practiced, and we hope that it is. But the rightness of a thing, the truthfulness of a thing, is not determined by what is popular or easy or widely accepted by people. Jesus determines for us the rightness and the truth of a thing. We follow Jesus regardless of whether the crowd does or not, regardless of the difficulty of the path that he takes us on. It's helpful for believers to remember what Jesus says here, especially in difficult times when they are facing persecution, when they are being marginalized, when they uh, are having their voice drown out by others, when their numbers are small. I want to say to you, pilgrim, continue on your journey. Even if you are the only one, you are on the road that leads to the celestial city. Verse 15, he says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Who are prophets? Well, a simple definition uh, that fits for this context is a person who claims to speak for or represent God. A person who claims to speak for or represent God. And they can be a true prophet or a false prophet. Jesus tells us to watch out. Beware, be on your guard for false prophets. He says they come in sheep's clothing, but they are ferocious wolves. In other words, they're not always easy to recognize. They may appear innocent and safe, but in reality they are dangerous and they can cause great harm. How do we recognize false prophets? Well, the next verses give us some help with that. In verse 16, it says, By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. By their fruit, a prophet will be recognized as true or false. Well, what is their fruit? We've talked about this before, but their fruit is the character of their life and the product of their ministry. We can look at a person's character, and we can look at the character of the lives of people who have been influenced by them. Now, we're not looking for perfect people. We won't find any of those. None of us can meet those kind of qualifications. You want to be careful with the measure you use. We're looking for people who have the fragrance of Jesus in their life. Do they love Jesus in his ways? 
are the fruit of the Holy Spirit present and growing in their life, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Do they have the attitude of a servant seeking to help people rather than gathering people to serve them? People mistakenly judge someone to be a true prophet oftentimes based on things like the miracles and the showy works they do, how moved people feel when the person speaks, the person's intelligence, their education, their musical talent, their writing ability, their athleticism, their wealth, and all kinds of other things. In the next verses, Jesus makes it clear that those kinds of things are not criteria that determine if a prophet is true or false. Verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. It's shocking to consider the criteria that Jesus mentions here, which are not qualifiers for entering his kingdom. Calling Jesus Lord is not a determining factor. Speaking prophecies in the name of Jesus is not a determining factor. Doing exorcisms in the name of Jesus is not a determining factor. Performing miracles in the name of Jesus is not a determining factor. Whew. Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Jesus says in verse 21 that the one who enters the kingdom of heaven is the one who does the will of the Father in heaven. A person can be doing good deeds and saying the right things outwardly, but if they have not come to Jesus Christ broken and humble, recognizing their need for his salvation, receiving him into their life, being born again by the Spirit of God, following Jesus as their Lord, then it's very doubtful that they know him or are known by him. In verse 24 through 27, it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. This parable is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, serving as the closing thought for us to take to heart. And we're being asked through this parable what we're going to do with what we have heard in this sermon. The words that Jesus has spoken to us, beginning in Matthew 5 and 6 and now chapter 7. Are we going to take these words to heart and follow them? Or are we going to continue on our way without it affecting us? The wise person, Jesus says, is the one who hears his words and they puts them into practice. This is how we build our firm foundation for our life, by practicing, by putting into practice the words of Jesus. The foolish person is the one who doesn't put the words of Jesus into practice, he says. 
James 1, 22, James said, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And this has really been the recurring message spoken to us through these passages that we've looked at today. To do the words of Jesus. To do what he says. Now, as we've come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, I want to make a closing reminder for us. I want to remind us that the Sermon on the Mount is not a description of what is necessary for us to get into the kingdom of God. This is not a list of qualifications for getting into heaven, unless you are foolish enough to try to get into heaven without Jesus as your Savior. Then this is your, your list of qualifications, and good luck with that. There's not a human being who has ever lived other than Jesus who has or could live up to the standard of holiness that Jesus has described for us in this sermon from Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7. But this is the ideal that we are aspiring to live up to as his followers. These are the ethics of the kingdom of God. These are the standards that the follower of Jesus continually seeks to put into practice in their life. And this is also the kind of world that we are looking forward to being established when Jesus comes back as king. Our hope and salvation are not in our self and our goodness. Our hope is in Jesus Christ who has saved us and enables us to follow him. We're not trusting in how good of a disciple we are. We're trusting in how good of a savior Jesus is. And we end with the last two verses of the chapter. It says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Look at how the people react to Jesus' teaching. They are amazed. They're astonished. The word means to be so amazed as to be practically overwhelmed. They're just dumbfounded by what they've just heard. And what is it that so amazes them about his teaching? It says he taught them as one who had authority. See, the Jewish teachers, they prided themselves on their knowledge of the various interpretations of the Old Testament scriptures given by the great Jewish teachers throughout the ages. They would quote and refer to what these teachers said to give credibility to their own teachings. And we, we all do the same thing. We stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. We rely on the work of others and add our contributions to the greater pool of knowledge. We're finite and limited in our knowledge and understanding of things. And we pool our resources together and we depend on those who've gone before us in that way. But not so with Jesus. Jesus didn't cite Rabbi so-and-so to give credibility to what he said. He taught like he was the very source of knowledge, because he is. His words sounded like they came straight from God, because he is. He stood on the shoulders of no other person, because upon his shoulders the whole world rests. Jesus didn't share opinions. He didn't share good ideas. He's the truth. And in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Amen. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you have preserved this teaching for us. All these many years you have preserved it for us. You've protected it so that we can benefit from it in our day.
And Lord, as we have come to the end of this uh, teaching, this sermon that you delivered and you have given to us as well, Lord, we recognize our shortcoming. We cry out for your mercy, Lord, and for your help. We want to put these words of yours into practice. We want to build our life on this firm foundation, Lord. We ask that you would help us. Our hope is in you, and we rely on you, Lord, and we look to you as our great Savior and our strength and the source of power that we need in order to carry these things out. We ask that we would have hearts that want to do these things, that we would live in these things, Lord, that these truths would become more and more who we are. In your name, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.